much for coming down for our second and first talk of Nicholas. Today we are very privileged to have with us Professor Mit Eric Mitka. Professor Mitka is a Herschel Smith Professor of Molecular Genetics, mm -hmm. affiliated with the Department of Genetics and the Deputy Director of the Vernon Institute, both at the University of Cambridge. He is an associated faculty member at the Tree of Life program at the Wellcome Sanger Institute and also the founder and director of the University of Cambridge spin off company, Storm Therapeutics. He is currently also a fellow tutor and director of studies at St. John's College, Cambridge. With that, let's welcome Professor Eric Mitzka to give a talk entitled The Amazing World of RNA. Professor Mitzka, please. exciting over the last year or so is that even my grandma knows uh, what RNA is. So that's good news. But um, having studied RNA for a while, I also have not been very focused, but we've been looking at all kinds of different aspects of RNA, mostly uh, with an interest on non-coding RNA. And uh, here are some of the topics that uh, we're studying in the lab. And um, I'm going to give you, I think, three stories uh, from the lab that are diverse and different, and maybe at least one of them is of interest to you. Okay, so I'm a bit older, I'm from the sort of Lego generation, and what's kind of cool about RNA is that it's made of very simple building blocks, right? ACGU, uh, with some minor modifications, and the cool thing is that these simple building blocks uh, form a linear uh, macromolecule, uh, and uh, this then gives you the RNA. And uh, a lot of information is in how you put these building blocks together, right, the sequence. And you're probably familiar with uh, watson crick base pairing, which is the way that this information can be read out, again, by another RNA molecule, or indeed you can go easily from DNA to RNA, and uh, in some instances also to protein. So RNA sequence is uh, super important, so we don't want really to know how many of the red or the green blocks we have, but uh, in what order that is similar. Now, we've been for many decades been, have been able to sort of understand the sequence of biological RNA molecules uh, using DNA sequencing technologies, and more recently using something called oxo sequencing, we can now sequence or read out uh, sequences of RNA directly. So that's great. And the first story of my talk will be dealing with um, the RNA sequence and the specificity of base pairing and what it can do. However, once these RNA molecules get longer, um, it turns out that RNA is um, kind of a lonely molecule, if you will, because DNA often comes with two strands. The two strands bind to each other. Oops, I'm not going to, God, this is like a constant on. I'm going to blind some. I'll put it away for a second. Um, the uh, double-stranded RNA, uh, sorry, the double-stranded DNA uh, is very happy with itself being double-stranded. It's very energetic favorable state. However, RNA often comes single-stranded and then it's kind of lonely and it would love to form some of these watson crick base pairs that I just mentioned. Therefore, if you have an RNA of a certain length, it will pop in some sort of uh, structure or shape and um, to understand uh, the functions of RNA, we would like to understand those shapes too. And uh, that's already considerably harder than trying to get uh, the primary sequence. And for, furthermore then, this has been known for a very long time, but uh, there has been a lot of excitement in the recent few years, um, is that RNA is also chemically modified. What I mean is that after the RNA molecule has been made, certain <coughs> positions within the RNA are chemically modified, and again, there's additional information put on the RNA. This can be read out and can be interpreted in different ways. And um, I'll get to this at the very end. So we've got sequence, we've got structure, and we've got a modification of the RNA, all playing a role in RNA biology. Okay, so sometimes people think about, you know, the origin of life. And I think it's perfectly reasonable, you're probably familiar with this idea that sort of life uh, emerged from uh, replicating RNA molecules, or that the early world uh, was an RNA world. 
However, I would like to argue that we live still in an RNA world because RNA being such an important uh, molecule is really sort of the computing powerhouse of the cell. Now, that's a pretty, uh, pretty strong statement. But I want you to think whenever you see an RNA molecule, uh, to think about base pairing and information exchange, maybe. Okay, as I said, so the introduction, uh, three stories. And uh, I want to mention along the way sort of three key members of my lab that, uh, that started the story off, of course. And uh, I tried to find some pictures to show how scary science is. Mm -hmm. So Alison actually here was a postdoc um, who joined the lab 10 years ago. And she uh, pioneered something to do with memories of RNA, RNA behaving in a weird way that suggests that um, it can uh, contribute to Harrisburg information in animals, and that's what I'll be talking about. So Alison has now moved on. She's now a professor at the University of Sydney in Australia. But, uh, you know, as you see, life started out being very scared, trying to tackle some interesting scientific questions. And to do this, uh, she used a common model organism um, that we use in the lab. It's called uh, C. elegans. It's a very simple animal. Normally, I bring some plates with me, but I wasn't sure if, you know, about the current rules, so I didn't. But um, it's about one millimeter in length, so you don't need an amazing microscope. You can use your iPhone uh, to look at these animals. Um, each animal has only 1,000 somatic cells. And if you're interested in inheritance and the rules of inheritance, what is awesome is that the generation time is only three days. So an adult has offspring, and they themselves become adults in about three days. And another point I want to make that will become important is that one animal has about 250 offspring. So you've got a lot of uh, children uh, to animals. Okay. And uh, when I talked about this idea of RNA memory, here's kind of the remarkable finding, and it does follow it. So let's imagine you have got a particular gene in your favorite worm here. That's my worm cartoon. And it could be the green gene. And for those of you who are biologists, you know, it's obviously a GP trans gene. So if you switch the GP trans gene off using a technique, which I'll get to in the end, using RNA eyes, so you knock down expression of the green gene, then the green disappears and you get a dark worm. Okay. In C. elegans, uh, this effect is uh, systemic. What I mean by this, if you inject, let's say, RNA into the animal, the RNA will spread throughout the animal. That means that we'll also get into the germline, we'll get into the eggs, so the next generation is also dark. But think about this kind of uh, experiment in the lab. So you have a certain quantity of RNA, you inject it into the animal, um, and then somehow it gets into the next generation. Uh, but each time there's a dilution factor of 250, right? Because one animal gives rise to 250 animals. So the expectation would be that, you know, maybe the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren are no longer affected, so this RNAi effect disappears. That's certainly the case if we use RNAi in the laboratory on a subculture system. You know, the effect works for a couple of days and then you need to apply it again if you want. But in C. elegans, that's exactly not what happens in most cases. In most cases, what we get is this so-called stochastic inheritance where if uh, I pick one of the children here, as I said, they will be dark, and then I examine the grandchildren. Some of the grandchildren, they still will have the silencing. And if I pick one that has lost the silencing, well, then, you know, essentially they will all stay green, so it's kind of boring. But if you pick a grandchild that still experiences the silencing, uh, then it will also have uh, children uh, or great-grandchildren now that uh, experience the silencing. And we've done this uh, again in the lab for at least 70 generations or so, then we've given up. But others have done this for hundreds of generations. They have obviously more patient than I am. In any case, in each generation, you might get 50% or more of the children to remember this RNAi expert. So what's going on? Because unless you believe in homeopathy or the memory of water, there must be an active maintenance mechanism in place here. And if you do believe in homeopathy, please come and see me after the lecture. <laughs> okay, so there's an active ma ma maintenance mechanism, uh, mechanism at, at work here, and uh, of course, I'm not just claiming this, I will show you in a second how it works. Uh, but uh, then uh, a little bit after we discovered this, uh, there was something even more dramatic or exciting. In fact, using a ver variation on this kind of mechanism that is at play here, uh, you can get an effect where essentially using genetic trickery, you can silence a particular gene essentially forever in the laboratory that is, right? So there's a particular gene, and you switch it off using some sort of RNA trickery, 
and then it's often the children, the grandchildren, and the great grandchildren forever, or at least for 70 generations or so. Okay. And uh, the other amazing thing is that you can uh, do this inheritance both through sperm and eggs, so you can go through the male or female germline, and you actually don't even need a gene locker. So again, I'm not going to explain you the detailed experiments, but essentially just go like that genetic trickery. Okay, what's going on? And you might have guessed because I'm in an RNA lab and I already mentioned RNA. It has all to do with RNA. And uh, one class of RNA that are small regulators of your RNAs, and they come sort of in three flavors. Um, they're the so-called microRNAs. You've probably heard of them. They're gene regulatory RNAs that exist in animals and plants. Then we've got the so-called siRNAs that you can buy from Sigma and you might use experimentally, but also exist in animals, plants, and fungi. And then there's a, a third type of RNA, the called so-called high RNA, that's specialized for animal germlines. And uh, they have a particular uh, trick up their sleeve. If you look at this, all and my diagram is not awesome, <laughs> but anyway. So the idea is that this little red thing here is the so-called uh, the small regulatory RNA, the microRNA is iRNA or pi RNA, and it recognizes using Watson Crick base pairing the target RNA. So here it's bound uh, to a messenger RNA and it uh, reduces the expression of that messenger RNA. Here a small RNA perfectly uh, Watson Crick base pairs with the target RNA and leads, uh, that leads to the cleavage of this RNA. And in both of these cases, the RNA is not naked, but it is uh, bound by a protein of the Argonaut superfamily. It's super because it's ultra conserved between bacteria and eukaryotes, and there are lots of examples. And they are responsible for the, the, these two pathways, and also for this pathway. You probably can't read this here, I can't, so blurry, I apologize for this, but it's at least green, so it's the same kind of thing, okay? So this is a modified Argonaut protein. You have also got a small uh, red RNA, this time a pi RNA. But what's different in this case? What's different in this case is that the interaction of the small RNA and the target is happening while the target is still being transcribed. So there's a gene being transcribed, and the RNA finds a specific gene using Watson Crick base pairing, sequence specificity, and binds it and does something. What does it do? Actually, all three pathways are generally negative. So they switch up translation, they degrade RNA, and here they switch up transcription and wrap up the local gene environment in the sort of a heterochromatin state. So here is a link or bridge between the RNA, the locus in the genome where it comes from, and uh, the local chromatin environment. And that's kind of the trick of some of this heritable stuff. Wonderful. Who cares? What does it mean? What biology underlies this pathway? You know, why would C. elegans inherit all this kind of stuff? And that's kind of, uh, kind of the big question that we're trying to answer. Because we've been working on these pathways for, you know, at least 10 years already. We understand a lot of the sort of me mechanistic bits and bobs. Others are still big problems. For example, one focus at the moment in the lab is to understand how <laughs> chromatin uh, information is inherited through the replication forks, stuff like this. But uh, I want to talk about the biology. What's the point of this heritable um, information in the first place? And the short answer is I still don't know, but I'll give you some examples of what we found out in the meantime. First of all, the question you might want to ask is, are any of these genes that are important for this heritable silencing important for the animal? I need to so knock them out and ask what happens. It turns out, disappointingly, initially nothing happened. So you and this was very depressing for me because I did this when I was still a postdoc before I started my own lab. You knock out these genes and the worms just laugh in your face. They're perfectly happy, nothing wrong with them. But you just have to be a bit more patient. And I'll give you just the end result. And what we're looking at here is if you're sort of interested in sort of cancer genetics or something like this, this looks a bit like a Kaplan Meyer curve where you would have, you know, percent alive and then time. This is kind of similar. Uh, what we're really looking at here is the percentage of animals in a family that are fertile, and um, this is the number of generations. So think about uh, European royal houses, right? They all seem to go extinct. Well, there are a few left, but uh, let's wait a bit. So this is exactly what's happening with this mutant. So here we've got wild type C. elegans. Let's say we brought it to the lab here, right? And it's fertile, of course, and then the next generation is fertile, and so forth. It will stay fertile forever, otherwise there wouldn't be any C. elegans labs in the world anymore. However, 
Um, if we look at, uh, don't worry too much about all these names here, it's just being very careful and controlling things well. But essentially, we're knocking out all this heritable uh, RNA pathway, this pi RNA pathway. And what happens is the animals are perfectly fine and they're fertile. But then look at this, after like 18, 20 generations of the annual temperature, even later, they become sterile. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? You know, you, you have a gene mutated in the genome. You're fine, your children are fine, your grandchildren are fine, your great-grandchildren are fine, and then suddenly, oh shit, you know, what did granddad do or grandma for a <laughs> Very curious. Um, so that this is something, you know, but think about it, right? I've talked before about an RNA memory. Now the RNA memory is broken, and somehow this leads to infertility. So maybe there's some interesting stuff being transmitted here. That's at least one possibility. Um, Again, we played with this a lot here. It's uh, something that I find is kind of cute, and that's what I'm going to show you. Um, this is just a different way of representing uh, the data. <coughs> Think about this, you know, this is like me. These are my children, grandchildren, and so at the end, oh, so sad. Anyway, so this is what happens to all of these mutants, right? So these are individual families of all of these mutants, and they all come to an end, meaning they end up with sterile offspring, you know, after a certain number of generations. And no, of course, 40 generations is how far to do with mice or stuff like this, right? We do with flies, but anyways. So, but let's look at here some other mutant animals. And look at them, now they become uh, uh, fertile forever again. They now live forever. The families live forever again. What's going on? So, again, there's some funky genetic terms there. Don't worry about it too much. These animals also have this whole pathway knocked out. But in addition, we just did one more thing, and I don't have time to tell you how we got to this. We essentially played with insulin signaling. So these animals have a hypomorphic uh, allele of the insulin receptor, and um, they essentially feel constantly as if they are starving, a little bit, or at least a little bit hungry, like me all the time. But um, essentially, playing with metabolism in these animals completely compensates for this loss of RNA memory. Crazy, no? And although I'm not showing you the data, you can even do this by constantly under um, feeding. I mean, if you keep the food low for these animals and the children and the grandchildren and so forth, then they're also fine. But if you let them eat as they normally would, then they get into trouble. Crazy. So what's going on? What is really going on is that in the germline, um, you've got gene expression like in other tissues, and you need this kind of RNA memory to keep let's say, bad genes um, in check. And uh, if you remove this kind of pathway, this kind of bad stuff accumulates, accumulates generation after generation, gets worse and worse because you're losing this epigenetic memory and then eventually becomes sterile. And uh, this turns to be out to be under the influence of the metabolism of the animal. And it turns out, and we only found this out, well, not my lab, but uh, another lab just found this out early in this year, has to do with um, direct regulation of ribosomal RNA, or at least that's one of the possible um, um, reasons why this is going on. Okay, so this suggests that there is some memory at least, and if you don't have it, it's bad, but what is it for? And also, we're still looking at mutants created in the lab. It's not really telling us anything about what the animal is doing in, in, in the wild, right? So the most interesting scenario would be could I give an animal, under otherwise normal conditions, some sort of information, and this information would be somehow related to an RNA memory that is heritable. And we've been looking, and others have been looking, there's been a lot of excitement about this in the last 10 years, and the short answer is, if you engineer stuff in the lab, you can get about three or four generations of memory. But I'm not convinced that there's any real example of something very natural, and particularly anything useful, that goes beyond one generation. And I'll show you the recent example of at least some usefulness um, of sort of uh, memory like this that lasts for one generation. Uh, so the elegance has changed, you know, you see, this has grown for different years, so we have updated our models of the elegance a bit. Anyway, here's a happy, uh, happy worm, and we're feeding it the normal stuff, and please don't ask me what we feed in the lab, it's not very nice, but it gets a normal lab diet, and it's kind of happy. And then from collection in the wild, we're now using Pseudomonas uh, species that C. elegant truly find very hard to digest. In fact, it kills it. Uh, so we add, so we, we have mono normal food, 
and we collect embryos from her, and then we put the embryos on this nasty food, and unfortunately it kills most of the offspring. Um, okay. So this is an essay for this pathogen, but we don't really care that much about it. How about if you let mom know trouble ahead? So if you grow mom on food, including a little bit of this stuff, and then collect embryos from her, then um, the next generation is doing much, much better. So this seems promising, and I can't tell you how many of the experiments like this we have done where you know this looks very promising. So how about you have two generations? Eh, nothing happening. So there is some sort of short-term memory for one generation present here, and there are other examples. But if you want these longer memories at the moment, these are all kinds of lab-engineered situations. So summary. We can potentially form memories for many, many generations in C. elegans at least. What's the point of it? Does it contribute to adaptation, microevolution, blah, blah, blah? We still don't know. Very frustrating, just as I said, I spent quite a bit of time on this already. But also, you might be thinking, who cares about C. elegans? I think you're perfectly right to think that. So, how about other stuff? Um, well, um, mostly we don't know. Probably the best understood system is uh, C. elegans. But there's a long-standing work in plants, for example, this uh, toad flat here, where it comes in two different flower varieties, and you might notice that this is, has bilateral flower symmetry, and uh, this is, um, what's it called, radial symmetry in the flower. And in fact, there's no genetic difference, I mean, no DNA difference between the two. It's also to do with stuff that I've just been talking about, with RNA, chromatin, DNA manipulation difference here. And this, uh, one state or the other state can persist for hundreds of years. In fact, Linné thought these were two different species by mistake because they look different. And then this is a famous example from mouse where these two are siblings, but this one is blonde and fat, and this is more looking like a normal mouse. And the difference is the diet of the mother, and this has been discussed to death, published to death on for the last 30, 40 years, but to be perfectly honest, it's again, it's a lab artifact, it's not a wild type strain of mice, it's a lab artifact that's similar to the C. elegans experiments that we've been using. Um, and we're still trying to uh, understand how important this stuff is in nature. Right, so if you're completely lost, bored, or both, let's give me, give me another chance because I'm going to switch tack completely and talk about something completely different. So essentially, story one already done. Story two. This was started by Omar Ziff, a postdoc in the lab. Um, he has also left me, everybody's leaving me, and I'm left behind, but um, he is now working for a startup company trying to use RNA therapeutically, very exciting. But uh, he uh, tried to tackle the question about structure of RNA. Now, people have worked a lot on the structure of RNA. You can use X-ray crystallography, you can use cryo-EM, you can use NMR, there are all kinds of tools to look at the structures of RNA. So why did Omar think he could come up with something new? Well, all the techniques that I mentioned so far have to do with dead RNA. RNA that's in vitro and not RNA inside cells. So what Omar was trying to think of, can we think of a better way of looking at RNA in living cells? That's the idea. That was kind of the cartoon that goes with it. And since I'm in a chemistry building, I have to show at least one chemical formula, meat sorbonne, a kind of uh, harmless looking molecule, and you might want to gather a guess what it does, it can intercalate um, into nucleic acids, and it's a very good intercalator into double-stranded RNA, and if you then play with, uh, um, with UV light, you can uh, form a crosslink between this thing here and uh, your double-stranded RNA. And in fact, I worked with this molecule when I was a postdoc for sort of the, the exciting early days of uh, microRNA biology, trying to understand how microRNAs work. And it just was terrible, because sorolin is an extremely inefficient crosslink of RNA. So I gave up on that, many others gave up on it, and I don't think anyone did something useful. But then fast forward, now we've got high throughput se sequencing data, and of course that I have to mention in the chemistry building as well, and uh, we all talk about high throughput sequencing, what we mean is usually Illumina sequencing, which is based on the technology developed here by uh, Shankar Balasubramanian and David Pledeman, um, yeah, when they formed a small company called Sulexa. Now, let us start talking about this because 
uh, when I came in, I saw Shankar leaving the building. He's obviously appalled what I'm going to say about this technology. But um, let me show you what uh, we did with it. So this is essentially a shitty cross linker of RNA. And we're going to couple it with something really high throughput, high throughput sequence. Okay. And the idea is to use cross linking to infer something about structure of RNA in living cells. Okay, so the idea is um, that we have some sort of RNA that makes kind of loopy loops. RNA tries to elapse making loops. And so here we've got a big RNA and it might uh, even interact with a small RNA, lovely. And then whenever you see the red dots here is when we have a Starling crosslink. And as I said, it's not going to super glue the whole thing together. You just get a crosslink and I think the way we can trade is about one crosslink per kilobase. And then we're going to do some uh, chemistry trickery. There's nothing special there. Essentially, we don't actually did use sorlin. I was misleading you there. We use a clickable form of sorlin that we then click biotin onto, and then we can do some pull down of the cross links. And then what we're going to do is we're going to ligate together fragments of RNA to form novel RNA molecules that don't exist by essentially looking what RNA molecules were close to each other. And for those of you who are supervised for CDB and B, and B, you know exactly what I'm talking about because it's related to the sort of high C technology that uh, we use to um, try to understand maybe the 4D genome structure um, in the nucleus. Right, okay. Essentially, some cross linking in living cells, some molecular biology, and some chemistry, and then a lot of sequencing in the end. So if you do this, you can get some sort of satisfying results. For example, ooh, that's a bit bad, but I hope you can see it. Essentially, this is um, a 2D cartoon of uh, the 18S ribosomal RNA subunit, and uh, we know its structure from in vitro work. And um, whenever there is a colored uh, uh, base here, that means that uh, this method that Omar developed, I haven't mentioned its name, it's called Comrades. The best thing I can say about it is that it's memorable because it's such a bad name, because normally sequencing um, methods are called very differently. Anyway, so this method can detect all of these different aspects of this uh, ribosomal RNA structure. And to be honest, we weren't even trying hard. This was kind of, sort of you know, leftover data. So at least for a known structure, it seems to find the right things. So Omar then decided to start playing and try to look at maybe things that he found more exciting. And at the time, what we decided to do is to start playing with viruses. Now, I work in an institute that does developmental biology and cancer. They weren't particularly excited about me starting to play with viruses that could infect humans. So we had to come to a compromise, an exciting enough virus for me, and one that we were allowed to work with. And uh, so we started looking around, and what we ended up with are these flabby viruses. Flabby viruses are very interesting because they have both an insect host and acid host. So I'll get back to this in the end. But in this group, there are some interesting viruses you probably have heard about, uh, Zika, Dengue, Yellow Fever, and West Nile. And maybe although you're more, most familiar with Zika from recent press, that's actually the, the least harmful virus, and that's the one we're allowed to work with. All four are related viruses. They are RNA viruses, right? Their whole genome is made of RNA. So I think that's a reasonably, reasonably good starting point. And also, there was a little bit known about the structure of these viruses, as I show here in this cartoon. And these structures are all in vitro uh, structures. And uh, so we started looking at Zika. And you might say, hang on a minute, you know, but there is the structure. We, we know the structure. But in reality, you know, this looks like this. That um, this is what Zika looks like. And all we know is from in vitro experiments, the very five prime, prime, prime tip and the three prime tip and the, these structures. So the question is, what's the structure of all the stuff in the middle? What is the structure inside living cells? And does the virus interact with any cellular RNAs? All these kind of fun things that we could address. And so Omar did. So he went through this process that I described, and then we need to present the data somehow. And what is popular is this sort of diagonal plot, where you've got the genome this way, the genome that way. And whenever you've got interactions between this part of the genome and this part of the genome will make a little dot here. So this has some sort of blot. This comes out of a computer, right? Anyway, so you get some sort of blot. You look at it and you're trying to see, does it mean anything, right? Um, the first thing to try maybe is, is it reproducible, right? 
So, because this, this uh, picture is highly derived. So, what Omar did, you take human placental cells, you infect them with Zika virus, then you wait a little bit, little bit, you go, and then you um, do this whole comrades method, meaning add the soil and do this cross linking, extract the cross links, do this sequencing, stick it in the computer, and analyze it in hopefully a smart way, and then come out with the data. So, is this reproducible? And the answer is uh, yes. Because here are three different experiments doing exactly the same thing um, from scratch, growing new cells. And hopefully, you would agree with me that these pictures look kind of similar to each other with all of these uh, potential RNA contacts. And these are controlled experiments. Of course, you could say this is highly reproducible. It's probably a highly reproducible artifact, right? But um, as I showed earlier, we can find at least some correct things, including structure of the ribosome. So for now, we give it a benefit of the doubt and assume uh, the data are correct. So if we then have all this data for Zika, what can we say about Zika? First of all, there has been this hypothesis that uh, Zika inside our cells lives in two uh, different forms. One form that is sort of elongated, and one form that is circular. The elongated form um, is the one that is supposedly the translating form. So this is an RNA, so it makes, needs to make proteins, of our proteins, right? And this replicating form is then when it meets an enzyme that is encoded by itself called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that just makes more viral RNA. So you get the viral proteins, get the viral RNA, stick them together, and you get the viral particles. So the question is, can we detect this inside cells? And lovingly, this is called the kissing virus. Lovingly. Anyway, um, so the short answer is, and it's not very nice to show, but inside this diagram, this blocks here correspond exactly to this particular case. Here are uh, two different diagrams, ways of representing the same data, essentially scanning the sequence of the, of the virus and see where does it uh, touch this particular sequence here. And there's a, there's a peak here, there's a peak here, and that's exactly this kissing region here. That's where they touch and then zip up a little bit and out from sleep. Nice. Um, to be able to see this. And also, you know, these in vitro um, pseudonauts, we can also find uh, at least some of them existing um, in living cells, fun. But maybe the most exciting was that we could really look at interactions between the virus RNA and the RNA inside cells. So, wow, this is completely messed up, but don't worry about it. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that we found that the virus inside, the viral RNA inside our cells, um, interacts with microRNAs, tRNAs, and small nuclear RNAs. Now, I'm going to tell you about one particular microRNA. And I mentioned microRNAs already at the beginning, so you're a little bit familiar with them. You've probably heard about them anyways. So the microRNA that specifically interacted with really, really high levels with um, the Zika virus inside our cells is a microRNA called TMIR21. It's a human microRNA, not much known about it. It's somehow involved in cancer in certain uh, model systems. But what is really amazing is that it specifically binds to one position of uh, the Zika virus genome at the 5 prime end of the genome. And again, I don't know what I did to these slides to make them so blurry. This is a PC. I have named a PC because you use a Mac, but probably something I did wrong. In any case, so MIR21, this microRNA, does Watson Crick base pairing with the 5 prime end. And it's just, if it wouldn't be blurry, you probably could see what it would say here. This is this kissing position. So exactly the position where the Zika virus uh, genome zips up when it shifts from translating to replicating, that's exactly the position where the microRNA binds. Super cool. Nobody had known this before. And of course, then there was a million hypothesis that somehow, you know, if you think about these two forms coexisting <coughs> inside cells, there needs to be some sort of, you know, switching in between. And if you think about it, the, the microRNA in MIR21 can bind here. If it binds here, then obviously this cannot zip up with this, right? So there might be uh, some sort of titration going on. And this is indeed the case. And I'm not showing you uh, all of the data. Maybe just uh, show the top here. So the question is, if this is really important for the virus to titrate and to switch appropriately between translating and replicating, then how about we CRISPR out MIR21 in this human cell that we're using and see what the virus does. 
And that's shown here. So these are these placental cells. And then we've got uh, two different CRISPR knockouts of this particular microRNA. And we get about a two-fold reduction in viral replication. And the same, more or less, is happening if we use uh, an RNA to inhibit a microRNA, the sort of anti-sense technology to inhibit microRNA. And using this experiment, which I'm going to skip a little bit, I'll run over time, we can show that it's really the microRNA acting by binding here that is important, not the microRNA acting in other ways. So just to summarize, the hypothesis is that uh, Zika virus is used as linear 21 microRNA to regulate itself and to switch between a translating and replicating state. And therefore, the year 21 is a potential new target for things like Zika and possibly also other flaviviruses. Maybe at this point you're thinking, this guy's completely mental. He's doing all the sequencing and then he claims these structures exist. So seeing is kind of believing. So it's good to have some other experiments to check maybe what's going on. So this is what we are doing here. So. Um, if you have here the viral RNA genome, what is now available are so-called single RNA fish probes. So these are RNA probes that are so bright that you can detect single RNAs, individual RNA molecules inside cells. So what we then did together with Daniel and Fusum's lab in Toronto, we label the 5' prime of the virus in red and the 3' prime end of the virus in green. And then we look in human placental cells infected with Zika virus, what's happening? And you can see, beautifully, you can see these sort of elongated viruses, and maybe you see a few of these kissing viruses as well. Kind of nice. Okay, just to finish the second story off, I just want to say one more thing, which is, I mentioned in the beginning that flaviviruses are kind of cool because they live in insects and they live in humans, right? I mean, it's not cool if you get infected by it, but from the virus's perspective, perspective isn't it amazing, the small genome needs to figure a way to live in us and an insect and there's slightly different environments, right? Temperature, uh, other RNAs present, other protein present in the cell, and this little thing can do it in both systems. So maybe a reasonably obvious question would be to ask, is the virus having the same shape inside a human cell or in a mosquito cell? So luckily, you not only can grow human cells in culture, you can also grow mosquito cells in, cu in culture. And that's uh, what Omar did here. And then he did exactly the same experiment, just using mosquito cells as in human cells. And then, again, I'm showing you this sort of uh, diagonal plot. And uh, if you, if you think, well, it looks kind of yellow. But it looks like, you know, like microarray, two-color microarray experiments that were done in the last century. Maybe you've seen it in some classes. The idea is you've got two samples, one red and one green, and uh, you know when both are the same, it's yellow. But again, this is not an actual hybridization. This is a computer-generated diagram. But hopefully you can see that most of it's yellow, i.e. the virus is not completely differently shaped. But maybe you can see there's some green spots and there's some red spots. So there's some unique structural features that exist in insect cells versus human cells. And that's indeed the case. And for example, insects don't have any near 21 microRNA, but OMA found another insect RNA interacting specifically with Zika virus. And what is missing now is to do some in vivo experiments, both in mice ideally and in insects, to follow this up. But of course, at this point, maybe you're thinking, who cares about Zika? Isn't there some other virus that we care about? And uh, OMA did think so too. So uh, last year, what he did is he um, got hold of um, some SARS-CoV-2, um, mostly in monkey cells, but also in human cells, and we look at the same thing. I'm not going to go into the virology here, but you know, we, I didn't really admit this, but flaviviruses we also chose because their genomes are kind of small, and we thought it's a good starting point. Coronaviruses are the most complex RNA viruses that there are, and they have an initial genomic RNA piece that then gets processed into little pieces, a little bit more complex, but nevertheless, um, this method worked brilliantly on this too. So, uh, what Omar found is essentially these are sort of long range interactions when we draw one of these arcs here. And um, they are different for the different RNAs, all kinds of 
stuff that we didn't know about coronaviruses before. There are a lot of these really long-range interactions. I wouldn't call them now kissing viruses either, but none of this was known before. Kind of exciting. And the, the most dramatic thing is happening here. So we are in part of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, where there are two protein open reading frames sitting next to each other. And look at this exact, look at this diagram. There's a black box, and then you can see the gray box is a little bit low. You might say, I cannot use PowerPoint, but it's not that. It's just that this is supposed to sit and symbolize a frame thing. So essentially, uh, the RNA is read in one frame, the protein, and then the ribosome has a little hiccup, and then shifts to another frame, and then reads the other protein. And that's there on purpose. Why? Well, the virus uses this as a control switch to be able to regulate the relative abundance of these proteins. Anyways, exactly in this position, there is this huge cross seen on the diagonal plot. Things have moved on within a year, our computational uh, tools have changed, so now this is still a similar diagonal plot, just looks a little bit different. And you can see this big cross here, right, off this diagonal. So this is a massive structure, and this is what it looks like. It's huge. So this is the, the position you look at, and again, this is unfortunately, you can't really see this. Anyway, it's about a thousand nucleotides of RNA that are zipped up in this kind of very weird way. There's this huge structure that forms. Nobody knew that before. Again, we are very excited about it because uh, it's a very interesting drug target uh, for approaching not only SARS-CoV-2, but probably other coronaviruses. Why? First of all, just because there's a structure, maybe the virus doesn't care, maybe just accidentally does some gobbledygook. But um, using um, sort of an evolutionary argument, um, it turns out that the positions that are zipping up here, um, where this kind of big arch is forming, these are under selective, uh, positive uh, selective pressure. Meaning there is a good um, sequence data argument by looking at the related viruses, that, um, that this is important, this interaction here between these two ends. By the way, we called it the FSE arch because we are not native English speakers. We are later told maybe we should have called it an arc, but now it's an arch. It's published, it's an arch for what, what it's worth. And uh, so what is cool is that this structure is conserved in all coronaviruses uh, that we've looked at, including in other things, for example, MERS. I don't know if you've heard of it. Anyway. Right, enough. Well, I'm not leaving the virus completely behind, but let's leave this behind for now and switch to something else. Third little story I want to tell you starts with uh, this guy here, A.R. Maori. Uh, he also came as a postdoc to the lab um, and also has left me, everyone, and just started his lab in the biochemistry department next door. Very exciting. And uh, what I want to talk to you about, if you're really excited about it, knock on his door, I'm sure you would love to tell you more about it, and maybe you want to even work with him on this. And it has to do with honeybees. By the way, what's the time? Sorry. Um, oh, very quickly. It starts with this idea of RNA. Okay, this is a Nobel Prize winning paper by Andy Fire and Craig Mellon and colleagues, where they discovered that if you inject double-stranded RNAs into C. elegans, you get a specific knockdown of a gene corresponding to this RNA. And you know, this is how the whole talk started in a way, right? And you probably have heard of it. 1998, single paper, single discovery, Nobel Prize. So get on with it. Or maybe we say, what have I done? Um, in any case, in the same year, Andy Fire published another paper, which was kind of weird and shocking. Essentially, what he found is if you, instead of injecting the RNA into the animal, you just take bacteria, which are its normal food, and you make them transgenic to express the RNA and just feed it to the animals, then you will get the same effect. No, no. So then you, these are GP expression animals, and then you feed them these bacteria, and this is the case. This was kind of shocking. And the short answer is we still don't know what it's good for. So, sorry, can I just ask, we have to room until 7 or 7.15? 9.30, he said. 9.30, he said. Excellent. <laughs> so, um, this has been shocking. I mean, this is, this is such a cool observation. Just imagine, you're going to have dinner later, maybe. Think about it. You don't expect the RNA from your food to be taken out by your body, and your body checking if there are any gene regulatory overlaps. 
and you watch some quick bass pair and you knock down jeans in your body. Now that doesn't sound like a great idea. But it's the elegance that's happening. And um, even back then, Andy Fire said, oh yeah, this must have blah, blah, blah. And the short answer, we still have no idea why this is happening. And then a few years ago, I wrote a piece challenging this problem in science. And I said, look, we better find this out. Is there social RNA? That was the question. And then uh, Omar came to lab and I said, well, if you're interested in social RNA, you're studying a stupid organism. Okay, first of all, again, you might say, who cares about this weird phenomenon if it's just something that happens in C. elegans, right? But it turns out it is not just happening in C. elegans. Uh, potato beetles works well, so um, agro companies have engineered plants to make double stranded RNA against genes in these guys, and they drop dead. Uh, planaria are super cool models. You can cut them into little pieces, and they all regrow whole animals. It's a great model for understanding regeneration. They do this RNAi by feeding, and also honeybees do this by feeding. In fact, um, what Ea did in his PhD, this has absolutely nothing to do with me, he worked on honeybees uh, back in Israel, and what you see here is an RNAi experiment on a kind of different scale. So these are actual beehives, although in my mind they're not the prettiest, but these are research beehives, and the stuff on top here is essentially flask filled with sugar solution and double-stranded RNA. And the idea is that uh, if these bees are infected with various nasties, including RNA viruses, you can cure the bees by giving them RNA medicine in the form of double-stranded RNA, which then primes them to help them cope or you know, charges of RNA I activity against uh, the viruses in the bee. Works. But the reason that I mean, it seems all fine, uh, but the reason that they are not on my door is because it works slightly too well. So what happened was, that you give this RNA medicine, then you take it off, and then the beehive stay immune and immune and immune. So generations after generations after generations of bees stay immune. Because the bees are slightly different, right? Because siblings raise siblings. So it's a generation of sisters, in a way, uh, being raised. And this seems a bit weird. And, you know, but he was aware of what we had done in C. elegans. So he asked, is it like C. elegans? That you know, the animals pass on RNA and essentially share this information with each other. At which point I said, ludicrous. Um, but uh, he wasn't uh, giving up easily. And he proposed that how the RNA can be shared is essentially in the breast milk of the honey. And that is in fact the first food that the honeybees eat, and that's the so-called water chain. So here's a little larva, and it's swimming in its first food, which is, uh, you know, deposited by its sisters the so-called royal jelly. And then I said, okay, yeah, you're telling me that there's RNA in this stuff, which is sweet, sugary, <coughs> non-sterile, and apparently, you know, in a beehive, the temperature is similar to the human body. And since we are in an RNA lab, I can tell you how easy it is to degrade RNA. That is not the right place to look for RNA. But as always, I'm always wrong. So, uh, yeah, we found tons, shit lots of RNA, <laughs> containing RNA fragments, uh, mostly larger than the sort of RNAi, sRNA uh, stuff, uh, of lots of viruses, some bRNA, and it's like, that is very strange. And then he showed me pictures like this, so we looked, where is this RNA? And it turns out the RNA is not really in solution, but it seems to be in sort of little chunks. And because I'm kind of a hungry kind of person, I call it like a chocolate chip cookie, where the cookie is the royal jelly, and then you get these little chocolate chips of RNA in there. But it still seems a bit funky. Anyway, so he went into the cold room, and it's like proper biochemistry. And uh, what he did is that he tried to purify um, any potential stuff in the royal jelly that could interact with RNA. And uh, I was very worried that this was, again, just you know, a chase and the outcome would be nothing. But he found exactly the one protein. So there's one specific protein in the jelly which uh, binds specifically and very tightly RNA and to a lesser extent also DNA. Uh, this is called major royal jelly protein 3. This is what it looks like. It has a protein-protein interaction domain that actually can multimerize itself. And then in the C-terminus there's this repeat sequence here which is strongly interacting with nucleic acids. And um, what is curious, it's not conclusive but curious, is that when you look at the evolutionary history of this protein. So, in fact, this protein itself is kind of ancient. You might even find similar uh, proteins in, in prokaryotes. 
But if you look at this repeat, this nucleic acid binding domain, it only exists in, sh in social insects. This was kind of interesting. Anyway, he did a lot of work on this, and I don't have time to go into detail. But essentially, this was what the chocolate chip looks like. This is supposed to be a movie, that's the thing. Is that thing? No. Well, too bad. But anyway, it makes these tree like structures. It's essentially sort of, um, you know, an aggregate of uh, RNA and um, uh, this one protein that forms inside the jelly. And you can reconstitute this by taking the, the purified protein or a recombinant protein and the RNA, you mix them together, and you make these funky structures. And again, I don't have time to show you, but it's not just some dead aggregate. In fact, this uh, RNA can go in and out of there, and it's very related to what is currently very on vogue, so-called vinaigrette biology, or uh, droplet biology, or liquid phase separated uh, biology, which often involves RNA and RNA binding proteins. And anyways, what this that makes this stuff special which is a model that we can make in the lab. It's kind of like a super transfection agent, if you will. So you can load your nucleic acid with a protein, and then you can just uh, dribble it onto cancer cells. Although, I don't think we should use it for your cells. <laughs> anyway, but you can drop it onto cells, and essentially it will deliver the nucleic acid into cells, and in bees, and he played with mosquito larva, and also in C. elegans, of course. So maybe there's something to this. Maybe the major royal jelly protein with its little nucleic acid binding uh, tail has evolved to essentially share RNA. For example, you know, you know, we are coughing out. Thank you. We are coughing out some viral um, RNA instead of just it going through the waste. Maybe get concentrated in this major royal um, chocolate cookie, uh, chocolate uh, uh, chunks, and. Um, hand it over to uh, the next generation of bees, and it can prime the immune system uh, to help out with viral infection. Sounds cool. To prove this, though, and I love genetics, I think we really need to CRISPR out this domain in, um, in insects, I mean, in, in, in honeybees. So I'm not going to do that. But um, thinking about what this could be good for, it turns out that since the beginning of RNA, so since 1998, everybody thought, brilliant. Because RNA medicines might not only be good for honeybees, as I showed you in the hives, but RNA might be an awesome medicine also, right? The problem is how do you deliver this medicine? And I don't mean now, like uh, probably some of you have been given some RNA medicine recently, which was uh, essentially RNA to make some protein against uh, protein of SARS-CoV-2 to raise immunity. So not mRNA injection somewhere to raise an immune response, but the living RNA in the sort of RNAi form to knock down anything from an oncogene to something else. The problem is that our body is kind of complex, lots of different organs, and RNA is not very stable, so it's very hard to efficiently uh, deliver RNA. And um, again, if you could read this, this is not being secrecy. I don't know what it is. But uh, maybe this is, is that a screen and this? I don't know. Anyway, so there's a bunch of microRNAs that have been targeted by companies as sort of RNA medicine, not for honeybees, but for humans. So maybe then finding or thinking about new delivery mechanisms for RNA, including maybe uh, something that comes from this royal jelly, uh, might be fun. However, it's a big problem, and I personally think um, we need to come up with other solutions. So if you think that RNA in principle is exciting as, you know, to target with regards to drugs, and I mentioned, for example, the structure in um, SARS-CoV-2 already, how else could we uh, target RNA? And I'm going to talk to it uh, uh, more, but I'm happy to answer a question about it. And it's also pure advertisement. But uh, five years ago, I co-founded a, a spin-out company uh, called Storm Therapeutics. It lives on the Weberham site. And it's trying to target RNA by sort of bypassing this RNA delivery problem. As I showed at the very beginning with my Lego Christmas tree, there's a lot of RNA modification that influences the function of RNA. And our idea is that we would target the enzymes that modify RNA. And um, those might have uh, beneficial aspect aspects um, that can be exploited therapeutically. And as we're doing when we have got the first molecule, um, an inhibitor of uh, RNA methyltransferase, metal 3, 
uh, getting ready for the clinic. This is exciting. But as I said, pure advertising because I'm a founder and director of the company. Let's go back to real science. I started off with a volcano. Let's enter, uh, let's, um, this is in the Atlantic. The trip of the lab, as I said, you know, it's very scary. Science, not only because, you know, he's just scared because I'm flying the drone, not because uh, the lab is so scary. But whatever you do, you know, if you want to discover something new, if you want to find out something exciting, you have to be brave and try new things, right? If you're doing the obvious thing, you're probably not going to find anything really exciting. I think that's me. And I would read out the names of the other collaborators, but I basically can't read their names. <laughs> just to say I haven't done anything really. But uh, thank you very much.
somehow signaling to ribosomal availability. It's all wishy-washy because we kind of still don't know. Um, and there's ongoing work. Unfortunately, not in my lab right now, but uh, there's ongoing work in a number of labs. So hopefully we know more soon. Uh, kind of. uh, also, though, you know, maybe I should say that um, this is a very famous mutation in insulin signaling. It also makes these animals live uh, longer. So this particular mutation in insulin signaling was first described by Cynthia Kenyon at UCSF. And she found that, uh, yeah, adults live longer. This is a different, completely different essay. But it's a very interesting uh, mutation that really gives you a very different sort of metabolic state inside the animal. Um, yeah. So can Congress predict the 3D structure of RNA as well? Of what, pardon? Of, uh, of 3D structure of RNA. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so, of course, in the end, all it does, it tells you the probability that this bit of RNA was cross-linked in the experiment to that other bit of RNA. But, surprisingly enough, if you have enough data of this kind, you can't, can't come up with a reasonable prediction of a 3D structure. Um, however, for Zika, I guess we have most information. So, for Zika, we see that there are several possible structures. I mean, I, I, I focus on the kissing and it's a big action, but there are also smaller changes that are probably regulatory states where Zika switch on one particular gene or switch RNA, switches it on or off for translation, these kind of things. And, you know, I think there's not quite enough information to really, you know, make a cartoon of what it would look like. Um, what would then be helpful is to correlate it with other, you know, dead structure data. Um, including, you know, doing uh, NMR or things like this on part of the of the genome of interest. So I think comrades can find interesting things where something is happening dynamically in an RNA structure, but I wouldn't use it as the only tool for getting the complete 3D structure. In a way, very analogous to this 4D genome tools like uh, high C, 4C, high C. I see. Thank you. You mentioned quite a lot like the RNA medicine and that they face like a delivery problem. So I'm interested in what other kinds of ways to get around the problem of delivery. Yeah, so traditional methods, I mean nanoparticles have been um, used quite a lot. So you make a nanoparticle, stuff it full of RNA, and then if you're very clever, for example in cancer, you can make these nanoparticles dissolve depending on pH. I'm, uh, this is not, not that I'm an expert on this, right? I have no clue about it. But um, that's what, you, what I read in papers. I've not done any of the experiments myself. So essentially, sort of either nanoparticles to just um, prolong the availability of RNA in the body, or even better, some targeted uh, methods. Then there are some others where you replace the RNA um, backbone by a peptide backbone. So they are, these are artificial molecules that have a peptide backbone, but then you've got bases, and um, biological systems find it very difficult to digest them. So it makes essentially like a super long-lived RNA inside cells. Then um, you've got other modification of bases and backbone. Oh, but people have thrown quite a bit at it. I just wanted to point out, you know, here we've got like a funky little protein that probably could be the starting point through some engineering uh, to think of a different way of delivering RNA. Most success has been uh, in the liver. Our liver loves taking up RNA. So if you want something delivered to, to the liver, it works beautifully. And the other thing is, of course, that um, let's say you want to get something into the eye or the lungs or places like this. So these are very accessible tissues, but others are very, very resistant to taking up RNA. So that's been kind of the problem. Um, yeah. So otherwise, I mean, you know, like people were arguing also with the RNA vaccines, which are of course super cool, and you know, they can be reprogrammed very easily, right? If the spike protein changes, you could just make a slightly different RNA, and then you'd have a, a better vaccine against a new variant. This kind of idea is true for all RNA vaccines, but um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, probably the best known success is, uh, you know, from work of uh, Adrian Kreiner's lab, um, you know, to, to um, affect splicing in, in vivo 
using uh, antisense oligonucleotides, which are sort of micro RNA like that seems to work very well. Yes, um, I was just wondering, you were talking about RNA modifications. Are they in any way perishable, or is it just kind of in one organism's lifetime that aren't the RNA modified? Yeah, so this is actually, <laughs> it's actually a, a really interesting question, and there's a heated debate about it, what we mean by heritable mm -hmm. exactly. So I would say that um, I don't know of any evidence of this. Although, you know, our company does RNA epigenetics, but it's more along the lines like people talk about chromatin modification as epigenetics. We don't want to imply anything really heritable here. I would say that um, um, some, her some inherited RNAs in the mammalian field have been shown to be modified, and this modification was shown to be important. But this, I think, is very early work, and I think it would be good to see this repeated a few more times and show up another system. So are, there are some sort of ideas that might be, but um, generally I think you know, the modification probably dies within the RNA, and what I find most exciting about RNA modification is that it changes the function of an RNA after it's being made, and that's somehow really dynamic, at least because I like to think about it sort of as, you know, as a regulatory mechanism or therapeutically, rather than a very long lived kind of thing. But, you know, going back to the fundamentals, in fact, pi RNAs are all modified. And it is kind of beautiful that um, pi RNAs um, in animals and siRNAs in plants actually have a modification of the three prime most nucleotide to make them more stable. So beautiful. Um, it's a similar modification that chemists put on to make siRNAs more stable when they use them therapeutically, but biology got there first. But it's kind of a boring modification in a way, it's just increased stability. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Well, we're not giving it for another hour.